SJC 12229, Commonwealth v. Nathaniel Brown. Take your time. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Tracy Cusick on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honors, the Commonwealth is asking this Court to vacate the allowance of the motion for new trial that was granted in the matter of Commonwealth versus Nathaniel, Gra Nathaniel Brown. And Mr. Brown was convicted of the first degree mur murder of Jordan Baskin, who was 22 years old at the time. Your Honor, in this case, the Commonwealth's first argument I'd like to focus on is the motion judge's finding that counsel had an actual conflict of interest that constrained the motion judge to grant the motion for new trial without a showing of prejudice. We, we, we don't have to get there if we decided on ineffective assistance, right? Uh, I believe that is potentially is it, correct, Your Honor, The actual yes. conflict is, is, is a more complicated issue given all the colloquies. Yes, Your Honor, and I suggest here with the conflict, again, there were multiple co colloquies by three trial judges who were, again, taking efforts to make sure that we did not end up here where there was an argument of a conflict of interest. Um, Do you mind starting with the uh, ineffective assistance? Certainly, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, with respect to the ineffective assistance of argument, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel argument, I'd suggest here um, counsel first did investigate this case by meeting with the defendant who was not in custody, who contacted her or a family member of his contacted her. And I suggest reading through all of the, the hearing at the motion for new trial and all of the paperwork suggests that, that the defendant certainly wanted to get that vehicle back that the police uh, had expressed an interest in and that they had custody of. There's some lack of clarity in the record about how the vehicle came to be in. But, but what, what happens when the counsel speaks to a client who lies to her, and that's what Judge Sullivan found, and they show up at the Milton Police Department, and there's the CPAC DLT who said this is a murder case. You know, if this was a movie, the heavy music would come in, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a big deal, and then she continues to go forward with an interview. That's the problem. Well, Your Honor, I would suggest here, counsel talked to the defendant about the dangers and ramifications of speaking with police and spent hours with him according to her testimony uh, and said that she was, uh, asked him first about the vehicle, did anything to do with that vehicle, would that be implicated in anything? She, she never calls the police department though, right? Other than calls to arrange right. the logistics of an interview, no. She doesn't inquire specifically what it's about. She doesn't say, hey, my client wants the motor vehicle back. How do we get this happen? How does this happen? Uh, Your Honor, it's, it's not entirely clear what was said, but it's certainly clear from, from her testimony that the driving interest here was the defendant wanted, wanted the car back that was used by his child's mother to, to drive the child around. I mean, given his representations, everything seems reasonable, I guess, but then when you get to the meeting itself, then we've got a, I think you, you, you've got a problem. Well, Your Honor, I'd suggest when they get to the meeting at the police station, first the attorney had repeatedly asked the defendant if he had any issues in Milton, specifically in Milton, specifically in Quincy, or anywhere else, and the defendant continually said, no, no, there's no issues. But then the officer tells her, this is an murder investigation. And we're looking at your client's role. Right. So at that point, one would hope that counsel would pause and talk to her client again before entering the room. 
Well, whether in hindsight, it's, it's I guess, easier to say that maybe that would have been a, a good thing to do, but not doing that, I suggest, does not transform this into ineffective assistance of counsel. When you're, you go with your client, you think maybe he's involved in some sort of drug uh, issue, you know, he's telling me the cars, he just wants the car back, and then you hear murder, you don't think that ordinary counsel would say, aha. I think in here, this attorney was not ineffective for not doing something different at the police station because review of her testimony indicates she thought the police thought the car was involved in some kind of drug activity. And uh, she did say that she remained convinced that the car wasn't involved in any sort of crime, and the defendant had told her it wasn't. But, but then she hears the M word. And then she hears the M word, but I suggest it was the M word uh, also it occurred in Milton, and the defendant had indicated no problems in Milton, and the police, she said she knew the police were investigating something in Milton. And but, so... so if it, in the light most favorable to her, she says, my, I asked my client, do you got any problems in Milton? He says, nope, I'm good in Milton. But then the police says, there's a murder in Milton. We want, we want to talk to your guy about that murder. That's a different ballgame, isn't it? It could be that maybe the police are wrong in, in, in a light most favorable to, your, to, to, the, to the attorney. But at that point, there's, 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 there's a, um, a duty to inquire or a duty to get the heck out of there. Well, I suggest counsel already inquired of the defendant. And again, the defendant is also, he's not in custody. He had counsel of his choosing and decided that they would go to the police station and was given Miranda warnings. And, and, and then, then, we get those, then we get those questions that happen in every murder case. What's your cell number? Hmm. And the defendant, well, the first question was, do you know this person who was Jordan Vaskin, the victim? And again, the defendant said he didn't. And... Uh, again, that was not something counsel could have known, and the defendant chose to lie in the police interview. But, but counsel knows he's lying once they ask about the cell phone, right? And she, does she keep allowing him to answer questions after he lies about the phone? I know she breaks for a second, right? But she keeps allowing him to, she knows he's now lying, and, and he's lying in a way that's silly. Well, she knows that she had used, she had communicated with him on a cell phone and she recognized one of the numbers. So she did have, there was a break where she spoke to him uh, and then the interview continued. So, uh, but I suggest prior to that. Once she, not only does she know we, we've gone from drugs to murder, but we've gone from lying to being caught lying um, and she knows it and it's a, a, a Well, I, I, I suggest. We're, we're getting dicey, aren't we? Your Honor, in hindsight, we're certainly getting dicey, but looking at what we knew at the time... Effective assistance is, right? It's hindsight. You know, we have to do a little hindsight. Well, if we look at what counsel knew at the time, she went to the interview with the defendant. And if we also look at if the ineffective assistance in counsel analysis and a potential motion to suppress, I suggest that the, I don't know, the victim, that, was, that wouldn't have been suppressed. And I suggest that if counsel should have stopped the interview after the cell phone lie, uh, those two items, I suggest, wouldn't have been suppressed if there had been a motion to suppress. So the, the harm is the consciousness of guilt evidence that comes out of the, the client's mouth. Yes, that he does. He does make these statements, which uh, I suggest turn out to be, you could, right. it, by inference, they were untrue. Um, but again, it's uh, that when counsel, if the court were to say counsel should have stopped the interview when he lied about the cell phone. If there were to be a motion to suppress, then perhaps everything after that point would be suppressed. But the fact that the defendant lied about knowing the victim, lied about being at the victim's home, and lied about the cell phone, I suggest, would not have been suppressed. But the thing is, he shouldn't have been in there talking to the police in the first place, right? No, Your Honor. I suggest that it was his decision to go there. He did... Even after he heard that it was, it was a murder investigation? Again, the defendant was not in custody. He chose an attorney, he went there, he made certain statements, and he was allowed to leave after the interview. I guess my point is, what was the attorney's role? What was his attorney's role in terms of guiding him, the defendant? She warned him of the dangers or ramifications of speaking to police, and she said, if there's anything, even if you don't want to tell me what it is, don't speak to the police. 
So there's nothing to support the motion judge's finding that based on what she said to him prior to going to the interview that he made these statements to police. This the motion judge made an inference that based on uh, counsel's um, deficient work, I don't know the exact wording, it, that's why he made a statement to police. And we, I suggest that that's not borne out by the record. We, we said that it's not categorical, the decision to walk your client into the police station. That's not uh, categorically ineffective. But we said it needs to be accompanied by an investigation. Here we have an investigation that was solely directed to the client, but none to the police. So we're, this is the next case. We're talking about what is the scope of that investigation, correct? Well, Your Honor, I suggest yes. And here, again, it's a non-custodial interview. This is not someone who is uh, being held by police in a situation where uh, there's a murder warrant in, in some of the cases or that the defendant is um, somehow you know, being told maybe you'll get to leave the police station if you talk to us. It's not that situation. They voluntarily went there. And again, here it was the defendant chose his attorney, chose what to tell her, chose to be untruthful with her, and chose to go to the police station to make these statements. And again, Wait, I suggest I, can, what could... What is the record on what the attorney asked the police when setting up the interview? Uh, it, it's not entirely... There's a little bit of inconsistencies in it. It appears that the attorney was primarily setting up the logistics, but with the defendant's request to do so, that the... She said she would never set a, a meeting up with police unless her client wanted her to do so. So the record, for example, did she say, what do you want to talk to my client about? There's nothing in the record to indicate that. It doesn't appear she made that inquiry. It appears that and, she... And the findings are contrary to that. Okay. Excuse but me, Your Honor? Judge Sullivan's findings are contrary to that. Yes, Your Honor. It appears that it was purely logistical what the attorney was, was arranging. And again, it was the defendant was telling her... I want this car back, and it was a big problem because they didn't have the car for, uh, for, the, for the child's mother to use. And again, I suggest that oh, maybe, the, maybe the car wasn't part of this offense. Maybe it was just a coincidence that police had that video, and that was what potentially prompted the defendant to really want to emphasize getting this car back. But I suggest he did go to the police station uh, with counsel, who he had again lied to, and it's, it's unclear what counsel could have done prior to going to the police station, and again, told it was a murder. Perhaps that was surprising to counsel, but again, she had inquired of him if he had any issues that he didn't want to tell her about, don't go to the police. Counsel, if, if, if she had heard, let's just imagine this is not the record we have, but if she had heard the day before, she had asked that question, and she said, by the way, what is this that about? And the person on the phone said, it's a murder investigation. Do you think that she would have had a duty to investigate at that point before bringing her client in the next day? I think it would have been a good idea to investigate, but whether it would be ineffective for not doing so, I don't think so. Because again, she's relying on what her, what her client has hired her to do. So you don't think it would be ineffective to rely on her client's prior denials that he had done anything wrong in connection with the car, which it sounds from the record it was a pretty specific to the car. He said there's no evidence in the car, which turned out to be correct. Um, so you're saying that there would not be ineffectiveness if she did nothing more after hearing it was a murder investigation, after receiving the earlier day that the news from her client that he didn't think he had, he was worried about the car. Well, Your Honor, I suggested it was more than just the car was what counsel talked to the defendant about. She talked to him about any issues. She talked first about the car, but she also said, are there any issues at all, even if you don't want to tell me what they are. So. And so she would not have had to follow up with him. It would not be constitutionally ineffective or deficient for her not to follow up with him after learning it was a murder investigation before walking into the interview. Uh, Your Honor, in this case, we also have the affidavit of the defendant who didn't testify, but he indicated in a sworn affidavit that he had heard that the police were your word was out that people were looking for him in connection to the But a the murder. focus is on the counsel's conduct here. So the question is, if counsel had learned a bit earlier that this was actually a murder investigation, would it be deficient of her not to follow up, at least with the client and possibly otherwise, before going into that interview? In the circumstances, again, of this record, I, I suggest it's not per se ineffective. Again, it, it would be a good idea to inquire of the, of the client. Um, but again, in this case, we have the defendant is sitting there with his lawyer. He is hearing what's being said. Um, but, but akin to what I was getting at, and I'm sure you're 
getting at, getting that is that you know if she had heard the day before, I think you say it would have been a good idea for her to follow up again with her client and maybe even do other investigation. As it actually happened here, she didn't hear until she's at the station. But at that point, she has options available to her still, does she not? At the station, yeah, they could have left. I mean, they could have turned around and left. Um, she did ultimately terminate the interview uh, later on when, when the officers asked the defendant to remove the bandage on his hand. Um, but I would suggest that it was not ineffective, even if she had known earlier it was about a murder, again, where she had inquired specifically of her client and told him specifically of the dangers and ramifications of speaking to police. So and let's just say we think it's ineffective. Um, is there a substantial likelihood here of a miscarriage of justice? I would suggest there isn't, given that there is quite a lot of evidence, uh, perhaps overwhelming evidence, of the defendant's guilt in this matter. Uh, and certainly this was um, much What do we do with the closing argument, though, where uh, the prosecutor really focused, at least for some part of the closing argument, on the consciousness of guilt stemming from the interview? Uh, I suggest that that's one part of a fairly comprehensive closing argument, and that there was ample... What's your best analogous case where we said no substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice, where there is this argument and, uh, of consciousness of guilt in the closing? and overwhelming evidence of guilt. Uh, Your, Your Honor, I apologize. I'm not, case names aren't coming to mind. But okay, I'll, I'll look. Thank you, though. There were no further questions. I would rest on my brief. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, Attorney Bean. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. It's John Henry Cunha for Mr. Brown. Um, I, before I begin, um, I, uh, reading our brief over the weekend, I was uh, appalled at some of the typos. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we got, it at, we got the brief in at 11.02 p.m. And, and uh, I thought we had vetted it properly, but we did not. Um, other than being embarrassing, there are a couple that I'd like to point out to you. One is on page 11, uh, where the word told is repeated twice, and it's a little unclear what I'm talking about, and that is that, in fact, um, trial counsel called a uh, Milton police detective and was told by that detective, who was also a woman, uh, um, that... Um, no, pardon me. Trial counsel told the police detective, who was also a woman, the location of the car and uh, where it could be picked up. Uh, perhaps more egregiously, um, on page... Is the error... What was the error? The, it, it's a little... It, it's, it's ambiguous as to who... I used trial counsel, twice. who was a woman, and then used her and told is said twice. Okay. So it's a little unclear who you. told the who what. The pronoun was redundant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Before you fall on your sword some more on typos, can I shift you to the substance for a second? Sure. Um, so, and again, having not been in your shoes, so you call the police, you're a defense counsel, you call the police, do they tell you what they're investigating? Do they... Or, Not unless you ask them. But if they ask, if you ask them, do they have any kind of obligation to? Nope, they don't. So often you get stiffed. Is that right? Well, uh, it, it, this is a pretty unusual circumstance, Judge. Um, I, I personally, I, and I know that this court has, um, you know, pointed, uh, said that uh, it isn't per se ineffective to bring your client to uh, speak to the police, but I would point out to you what Justice Jackson said in Watts versus Indiana, which is quoted by this court in Simon, and, and I quote, any lawyer worth his salt will tell the suspect in no uncertain terms to make no statement to police under any circumstances. So I, I get, I'm just trying to figure out sort of, we've rejected that though. No, so, well, well, I'm not sure you sure have, Judge, because the word suspect is important there. Okay. In other words, somebody may not be a suspect, and, and counsel may say it's appropriate to speak to the police. But, but, but here we have at least, I guess you could infer that they'd say something, because when they went to the police station, the lead investigator says, here's why we're here. They didn't yes. just wait to get him in the box and No, that's right. And they didn't, they didn't surprise him halfway through the interview. Right. Um, I, I will say this too, Judge. Uh, the, Com the Commonwealth's argument is premised on the fact that Mr. Brown lied to trial counsel about being guilty. 
And I know we have a guilty finding here, but I don't accept that premise. Uh, the, 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 what the focus was on the car, was on the automobile. Oh, no, no, he, she, the, the findings as I read them was, did you do anything in Milton? Right, and he says he didn't. I didn't. He says he didn't. He still says he didn't. Well, I got you on that one, right. <laughs> so either way, he's got, a, he's got a problem that she's not advising him about. He's got a problem that the police know about and, and uh, that she doesn't... And I, I know that, you know, the... the well, as far as I... It, it, frankly, walking a client into a police station and being told that, you know, um, by, my client is telling me that... There, that there's nothing here, but I think it's about drugs. So already she's going there thinking that she's walking the client in, uh, even though he's denying any problem, she's already thinking that he's got criminal responsibility. She's done no investigation. Um, I, I, it, it's, I, I do not in any way concede that bringing him there without doing an investigation is acceptable. It's not. And then being told, that walking in the door and being told, oh, by the way, this is a murder? And, okay, what do you want to know? I mean, it's, it, frankly, the conduct is outrageous. It, 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 this is an actual conflict of interest, and uh, the, the, the lawyer should have known that a separate argument? I mean, let's stick with the ineffective assistance of counsel for a moment. Why, assuming we agree with you that this was ineffective once she heard it was the murder, investigation and um, why is there a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice given um, I, although I'm sure your client proclaims his innocence there was a lot of evidence suggesting that he and the victim were planning to meet up that they were waiting for each other uh, minutes before the actual well, murder and you know um, uh, so so tell me why given the nature of the evidence against him this is a substantial likelihood of a miscarriage I, I, and of I will I will reply to that judge but I don't think you can you can separate the fact this is not a situation where one lawyer, say, for instance, in Celeste, there's one lawyer who uh, misconduct is, is questioned, but is not the trial lawyer. You can't separate the fact that the lawyer who took him to the station is also the lawyer who was the trial counsel. Yeah, but we, <laughs> and it's an actual conflict. Yeah, but okay. okay. Yeah. And, and to answer your question, and, and we have spent uh, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of paper. Um, for the first time in my career, I filed an oversized brief here because I felt that the facts were so important to this court. And I'd suggest that uh, the evidence against him was not overwhelming. Um, and that, uh, that no one saw him on the scene. Uh, there is this possibility that the, uh, a car that's associated with him was seen uh, driving into Milton and out of Milton. Uh, but uh, as the... He's, he's the last drug deal. We could he say, is the last possible drug deal. Right. That's the strongest evidence the government has is there's, he's, there's a drug deal gone bad and he's the last person identifiable by cell phone records, text messages, et cetera, to, to engage that drug deal. Well, as a possibility, we don't know that we don't right. know. And then there's the, the, the fingerprint on the bag of right. drugs. The, there's the palm print on the porch. Right. Well, he's been there before. There's a, there is a relationship, uh, albeit... Uh, uh, an illegal relationship, or a relationship. I don't that's think the relationship's illeg illegal. But. Uh, that's based on illegality, and uh, so uh, and with respect to the bag, um, there was testimony from and the, his cell phone. There's te testimony from people in the car that they had purchased drugs from him earlier that day. So the fact that there's a fingerprint on a on a bag is consistent with. But that. what about the I DNA under the fingernails and the cut? Yep. Um, the Again, the cut, uh, actually the government didn't uh, emphasize that, although I would, I would agree with you, Judge, that, uh, that it is uh, inculpatory. And that's one of the problems with, the, uh, with the, uh, in, you know, bringing him to that interrogation. Well, the DNA under the fingernails is really inculpatory. Well, both the Commonwealth um, expert and the defense expert said that um, it's easily uh, placed under the fingernails, and the defense expert said it could, it could last for weeks. So th th there's there evidence of a prior fight between these two. Uh, 
Well, no one was focusing on that, Judge, so I don't know the answer to that. See, I would have thought that you might focus on the fact that the prosecutor used the interview as consciousness of guilt to butt rest any holes um, in the and, and, and what that, might be considered lots of evidence that your client and this victim were together right before he was killed. Well, Judge, uh, or are you I, not I, suggesting I, that? Are you saying that 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 closing argument was really not the? No, I'm saying the closing argument was very important, and, 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 and frankly, in addition to the closing argument, there was a very powerful uh, uh, jury instruction on uh, consciousness of guilt that specifically mentioned the lies and uh, that Mr. Brown had told to the police when he was interviewed. So, no, I, I definitely think that there was the, 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 the closing argument uh, was, was, was very important. But I, I, I'm suggesting, Judge, that it, it's not an overwhelming case. All right, so I guess on the, um, I know why you want to get to conflict, because then there's no prejudice problem, right, on, on an actual conflict. That's correct, Judge, on, and, on, I, and on, I don't on, think you can actually separate them. Right, yeah. on, well, I think you can, but let's get to this. Well, I get, well let's see you're the judge. <laughs> let's see what, but anyway, um, so there's two arguments raised. One's the ineffective assistance, which requires a showing of prejudice, and the second is, potential conflict versus actual conflict, actual conflict, right. you win no matter what. Um, I'm just troubled by the multiple colloquies, including the ones by the DA who say, wait a minute, we're going to end up in front of the SJC here. Um, let's talk to this. And the, the, the DA raises it like three times, and judges have various colloquies with your client. Right. To, to, it, to, it was, to, the, to the, the prosecutor mentioned it once. Okay. Okay. And uh, that was not during the colloquy. It, I believe it was in the same hearing as the colloquy. So, okay, so, so I, like, I, there was a conversation and the colloquy follows. Is, is right, and the memory. colloquy was all about the Patterson issue. Um, any waiver has to be knowing and intelligent. That's just essential black letter constitutional. The Patterson issue is the test that she would be a witness. That's correct. And that's different from the conflict you're talking about, which is she doesn't file the motion to suppress because she's going to look stupid. Based on ineffective assistance. Correct. She, 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 they step around the Patterson issue by saying, we agree with the police report. And the police report, for instance, doesn't say that she stepped out to speak to him in the hallway halfway through. And she says, we agree entirely with that. that that's, that's another issue. But I haven't read these, but it's clear in the colloquy they're focused on the fact that the issue is whether she's going to have to testify to contradict the police and what they said, not that she's going to confirm I messed up. <laughs> that's correct. And, 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 and also, um, uh, uh, Justice Kafka, the, the the possibility also is that although we agree with this police report, we don't know there may be something that comes out during the trial where she would have to testify. And he waived that. He waived anything with respect to the Patterson issue. I'm just trying to understand the breadth of this. Um, if every time someone's ineffective for not filing a motion to suppress, um, it, you're limiting it. It's, the conflict of interest arises when it's your own in what? Because we often fail to file motions to suppress and try the cases. And I'm just trying to understand. It's, the it, 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 is, well, it's, it, it's this conflict. I, this has the potential to be a giant conflict of interest thing you're creating here. I'm just trying to I, understand I, its limitations. I, I don't think I created this, Judge. I think that the trial counsel created it. But uh, it's her conduct. She could not even evaluate whether to file a motion to suppress. This isn't just a motion to suppress should have been filed by her. She could not file a motion to suppress. So, so I, I mean, Celeste comes out, and the judge says, wait a minute. Take a look. Everybody read this, and then let's talk. Right. So and no one does. It wasn't like the Celeste issue wasn't raised. The judge right. said, let's have a reading session. Right. And, and nobody does. What's the result of, what's the result of that, not, they're, that they're, discussion? Zip. Celeste's never mentioned again until, until the trial judge does, I think she, she, she references it. Uh, but neither lawyer, neither the prosecutor nor the trial, nor trial counsel, at any time, the word Celeste never passes either, either of their lips. Was the timing of Celeste after the last colloquy? Yes. 
after both. There were two colloquies, not three. Um, the trial judge mentions the fact that there were colloquies and opined that they were good colloquies. Um, and and I, I think they were with respect to the Patterson issue, but not with respect to uh, the issue that, that, that was raised by Celester. And neither counsel ever mentioned Celester. In fact, when, when, when asked at the hearing on the motion for new trial but I thought the about prosecutor Celeste, mentioned, trial counsel didn't remember it. I huh? thought the prosecutor it. mentioned the possibility of a motion to suppress. That was before Celester. Okay. Yes, that's what, that, that's what Justice Gaziano uh, just said. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and nobody says anything. Yeah, and that, that was during a, and maybe the colloquy didn't match that comment, and then Celester comes up, so there was a second opportunity to get to this. Correct. And, you, and your, your view is neither of the colloquies was sufficient for that? I, judge, I think, frankly, if you read it, it's very clear. They're talking about her testimony. The, this all came about because trial counsel filed, the, the government put uh, trial counsel's name on the witness list because of the fact that, that she had been present during this interview. She then filed a, a motion challenging that, and it was in light of that, it was all about her testimony. It was in light of that motion, excuse me, putting on the, uh, the, on the witness list and then the motion that, that, that this came about because it was all about Patterson. It's, it, it's, it was understandable that they were very focused on that given the unusual circumstance of counsel being a potential witness and it appears to have blinded everyone yes. to any other issue. Um, but just putting, going back into the position of the trial court, can you respond to the concern that the trial court was a little bit between a rock and a hard place given the possibility of structural error if the defendant slash client here was was denied counsel of his choice where the defendant repeatedly, despite this extremely unusual circumstance implicating a potential client, over and over again said that he wanted to stick with this lawyer? He wanted to stick with his lawyer because they understood the issue to be Patterson. They had the police report, and the police report there was no, there was no cavil with it. There was no, there was no uh, disputing it, 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 it. And I think trial counsel said, "We, we have no, no question about that police report at all." So it was a discrete issue that was dealt with, with uh, uh, colloquies that went to the discrete issue. Uh, if, 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 if somebody says, um, "I want this lawyer." and somehow that applies to everything in the world, then the concept of a knowing and intelligent waiver is out the window. And we don't know what conversations were had with your clients with, with respect to the Celeste issue. We do, because at the, at the hearing, uh, trial counsel said that her conversations were, with him were about the Patterson issue. Okay, the, the, the hearing in front of Judge Sullivan. The, yes, yes, Your Honor, yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't very explicit Pro, on Pronouns that. again. Pardon me? Pronouns again. Or, yes, or yeah, yeah. Articles. <laughs> Yeah. Can, you, can you identify what you think is the strongest evidence that counsel was actually laboring under a conflict and affected by this conflict as opposed to the conflict just being a potential conflict where we have to see prejudice as well? I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, Judge, because the, um, having not read Celester, that, uh, I think that uh, trial counsel was perhaps ignorant of the, of the, of the problem. Mm. Um, you know, the... the, the, the under, the, under, under federal Both jurisprudence, uh, there is no right to counsel at that stage. It's only under Article 12 that there's the right to counsel. So I, I, don't, I don't know her thought processes, but um, uh, certainly uh, it, it, it is inexplicable to me, quite frankly, that if a prosecutor says a motion to suppress should have been filed, uh, or could have been filed, that any, any defense lawyer in that position would have said, well, let me think about that. But let me, you know, that would make me, you know, so. Can you I, clarify? You know, I, 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 I forget. Did, I, I, the, did the prosecutor say a motion to suppress should have been filed based upon ineffective didn't assistance? Didn't say should. They said, well, maybe somebody, maybe another lawyer would file a motion to suppress. I based, think that was. That. But, but was it based upon ineffective assistance? It, it was, there was no explication of the reason for it. Yeah, it was just a, it was a, um, a generic, uh, maybe another lawyer could file, would, would file one or would think about filing. I, I'm over. I'm welcome any other questions, but if there are none, uh, I rest on my brief. <laughs>